Perhaps the most blatantly Jewishly named brewery in America's history has been around for over a quarter of a century. But about a year ago, they put out a press release saying they're closing operations, but they're still around. So what's going on? And that is something we're going to explore, both the past, the present, and the future of Schmaltz Brewing in this 117th episode of The Jewish Shrinking Show, bringing L'Chaim to life. L'chaim. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan. I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest of the show, Jeremy Cowan. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Thanks, Drew. My pleasure. My pleasure. So for those who are less familiar with Jeremy here, he is the founder of Schmaltz Brewing Company, about which we are discussing in this episode and for which he had been owner and president for many years, 25 years, correct? 25, 26. 25 or 26. Yes. <laughs> Depending yes. on which, uh, which month and which high holiday you figure I started for. Wonderful. And uh, in this capacity, he has supervised all brand development, sales, and marketing, as well as having managed relationships with wholesalers and retailers across more than 25, again, the number 25, 25 states. Schmaltz Brewing is not his only brewery with which he has been involved, as he is also the owner and president of Alphabet City uh, Brewing Company, as well as having created and involved five brand lineups with over 100 beer styles. One of these was Coney Island Brewing Company, which he founded and then sold to Boston Beer slash Sam Adams nine years ago in 2013. He also opened and supervised multiple retail tasting rooms. He is also the co-founder and the pre- first president of the New York City Brewers Guild. He is also the author of Craft Beer Bar Mitzvah, and he further serves as an advisor and cult- consultant for several client- clients, uh, such as ProBrewer.com, Atmosphere TV, Great Gorge, and August Point Advisors. So, Jeremy, that's a lot. Definitely <laughs> There's more a lot than a lot of also's mouth. in there. I appreciate that. What was that? There's a lot of also's in there. I appreciate that. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. It, it, it's the reality. Many, many chapters, many years. Yeah. And speaking of chapters, so this craft beer bar mitzvah, that is the first, I guess you would say the first half of your Schmaltz brewing experience, right? Out of yeah, the 25 absolutely. or 26 years. Yeah, I wrote that. It's coming up. Uh, we wrote, I wrote it um, in 2010 and um, uh, kind of 2009, launched it in 2010 and then mm-hmm. did a book tour for a year or two and went all over the place. It was really wonderful, including wow. a number of Jewish book uh, festivals, really amazing ones in St. Louis, and um, really had an incredible time uh, market having fun. Uh, it seems like a lifetime ago, but then I look, poke around in the book a little bit and think, oh my God, it's like yesterday. So it's wow. a little of both. A little wow. of both. So I, although there will be an opportunity at the end to pitch stuff, but for those who do want to find out more after listening to this episode about the history, so I guess two questions. One is some highlights from the first 13 years. And then I guess, how has Schmaltz evolved in the last 12 slash 13 years? How to sum up uh, even 25 years. I Mm -hmm. think it it really has not been one single trajectory. There have definitely been eras for Schmaltz Brewing, including an era which uh, for most of those years, it was uh, the brand was known as Hebrew, the chosen beer. Hmm. And so that was really what I uh, focused on for the first 17 years. Schmaltz was the name that I came up with um, after the inside joke from my group of friends from high school that was, you know, every other group in the U.S. has their own beer and microbrews are pretty cool. Why don't why don't we start a beer and it should be called Hebrew, the chosen beer. And the Mm -hmm. tagline on the back of the t-shirt would be don't pass out, pass over. (laughs) And it just uh, sat as an inside joke with my friends. Coincidentally, this uh, coming up, I'm going to my high school reunion. I will see a bunch of them. And uh, that high school reunion is 35 years. So that joke's been running just about that long. (laughs) Uh, But it really took me 10 years to even dabble in making the first Hebrew beer, which Mm -hmm. predictably enough would be called, of course, Genesis Ale. Mm -hmm. And Genesis was uh, the first beer that we brewed in Northern California. Um, I was living in San Francisco Mm -hmm. and um, we hand squeezed pomegranates uh, in my apartment in San Francisco in the Mission District because (laughs) that long ago there wasn't any real access to pomegranate juice. And I wanted to add uh, a flavor of uh, Jewish tradition to uh, uh, to the beer itself, in addition to all the punchlines that I was able to put on the beer label (laughs) and and the press release. And uh, it's been, it was really wonderful to uh, learning for myself um, and tying the brand almost throughout its history to uh, things like the seven sacred species 
Mm -hmm. um, which is good timing right now, considering that, uh, um, you know, in the readings for the high holidays, Moses doesn't quite get to the promised land, Mm -hmm. but uh, he does know that it's a land flowing with milk and honey and that there's pomegranates, grapes, dates, uh, figs and olives. And so um, the beer really tied in Mm -hmm. in many ways to that history. And I was really proud of that. I was going to say, fun fact, six of the seven are fermentable. So you can. Absolutely. Well, and so the one I struggled with, so when Mm -hmm. wheat and barley are the other two, the one I struggled with was olives. And the uh, non-fermentable one. Non-fermentable. But I had the idea that maybe we'd be able to find some olive barrels and age. We had a barrel aging program for many, many years. Um, But olive wood barrels don't impart a lot of flavor and they are enormously expensive considering, uh, you know, Hmm. how old olive trees have to be to get the barrel made. (laughs) Um, So, and also one of my absolute heroes, Dogfish Ed uh, Mm -hmm. from Delaware, a couple of, about a year before I was getting really serious, I'd done the a series called Rejuvenator, which was a half uh, lager, half Belgian ale Ooh. in traditions of sacred brewing from across Europe. Mm. And I'd been adding different fruits um, and different sacred species. And I was getting towards olives and dogfish had made an olive beer the year before. And uh-huh. um, one of my heroes is Sam, who's the owner of dogfish. And I, come and I was like, how was the olive beer? And he said, it was a disaster. <laughs> Don't bother. <laughs> I was like, look, if dogfish is not necessarily going to uh, be be uh, getting out there with an olive beer, I don't think Schmaltz Brewing needs to worry about it either. So yeah. we just focused on um, on uh, making really incredible beers for many, many years. I'm mm-hmm. really proud of the level of quality and uniqueness and having a, a real Jewish spin to all of the special releases across, uh, like we talked about in the beginning, over 100 beers over the years. So can you take us back 26, 27 years when you first found it? Of course, you mentioned it's a sort of a joke amongst your high school friends of, of the naming piece of it. But how did you, first of all, how did you decide? Actually, let me take a further step back. In late 90s, <laughs> what was the craft beer scene like in general that you thought you'd throw your hat in the ring? The second thing is, d- yes, it's a high school joke, but to make it also marketable and otherwise financially viable, yeah. uh, what was the... I, have you got also this, this is not so much a late nineties thing. This is a last 26 years thing. Has there been a lot of hate or anti-Semitic stuff? It's a incredible, let me say this for viewers or listeners who are catching this. A lot of the names are very Jewish. It's not just the Hebrew, which is okay. It's Jewish, but a lot of the <laughs> names of the beers are incredibly yeah. Jewish. And I remember it was a year or two ago, there was a Hanukkah beer with like jelly in it. So there's very noticeable Jewish themes in the names. You, you can't miss it. So yeah, it's what, what was all uh, that we like? We called it unapologetically Jewish, and uh, every step of the way. I mean, mm-hmm. we made jelly donut beers um, to go with sufgani oats. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a beer called Rejuvenator. Jubilation was our anniversary mm-hmm. beer. Each mm-hmm. year came out, started with eight malts, eight hops, and eight percent alcohol, mm-hmm. and ended up going up to uh, we got to seventeen malts, seventeen hops, and seventeen percent alcohol. Mm-hmm. And then were they, were they barley wine that beer? Yeah, were they yeah. Barley yeah, amazing, amazing mm-hmm. dark barley, uh, mm-hmm. dark barley wines and strong beers. That was kind of what we were known for. We had a tribute beer to Lenny Bruce. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a beer called Origin, which is a pomegranate strong ale. Um, we of course had to go completely over the top, and we did have a, an April Fools' press release that I wrote one year for our new our new beer called Circumcession Ale, mm-hmm. and um, that was of course cut above the rest and mm-hmm. all the rest. Uh, so much stick and mm-hmm. it was a joke for for um april fools but mm-hmm. a lot of my beer industry friends and colleagues and media people thought it was so funny that um even in the boston one of the boston papers he actually put it on the website as if it had happened <laughs> so the next year doing the perfect uh bit of shtick that we could come up with we actually made a beer uh called circumcession ale for a couple of years so wow um, but we also did uh, an enormous amount of wonderful fundraisers, um, a project called Shebrew, which I was really proud of mm-hmm. for International Women's Collaboration Brew Day. Mm-hmm. Um, we collaborated with women-owned breweries and cideries that were friends of mine and, and raised money for women in craft beer. Um, we did an uh, enormous amount of events and, and uh, experiences with Jewish community groups across the country and 
So when I when I first started, that was really the reason um, I started in the first place. Is I always say it was an inside joke, but I was really mm-hmm. serious about this. Was my way to participate in the Jewish community and the mm-hmm. Jewish experiment. Um, mm-hmm. I had come back from studying in Israel for five months and uh, came back to San Francisco when I was 25. And I was volunteering for places like the Israel Center and going to the Jewish Museum and um, in touch with uh, the JCC and Hillel's and um, Federation Young Adults Divisions. And this ended up being my kind of vehicle to participate in the community across the country. It started in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. quickly um, started selling a little tiny bit of beer in Los Angeles, uh, a little in Chicago. The Chicago Federation was a huge supporter. Um, hmm. One of my leave note, like you know, uh, alums was running young adults in Chicago and she brought me out a couple of times. Wow. And then New York turned into another great place to be able to sell some beer. And um, to your point, that era was really a small, small world for craft beer. It was then it was called micro brews. Oh, and right. in the 90s. Uh, Right. Yeah, yeah, in the late 90s. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was when Pete's Wicked Ale and um, Sam Adams and Sierra Nevada, um, Brooklyn mm-hmm. Brewery. So it was a really um, small industry at that time. It's now grown to almost um, you know, definitely double digits in volume and mm-hmm. almost 20% by dollars. At that time, it was about 2 to 3% of the market. Mm-hmm. So a lot of hard work from enormous amount of people that I was inspired by. Um, Dogfish and Stone and Victory and Allagash and mm-hmm. um, so many friends in the beer industry. And we had an amazing time um, getting from 2% to 20%. Mm-hmm. And it was organic growth. Um, it wasn't millions of dollars spent on advertising for mm-hmm. brands like Schmaltz Brewing and Hebrew Beer. Mm-hmm. It was uh, a, a very dedicated group of wonderful staff that slowly grew over many, many years. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics, as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you, and now back into the show. So, late 90s, microcraft movement, and it was small. And then when did you move to the East Coast for the brewing operations? Yeah, so from 96 to 2003, um, 2002, 2003, I was brewing uh, in Northern California with Anderson Brewing Company. Um, We started with a tiny little brewery in Cupertino, uh, just next to where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And we made 100 cases of beer of Hebrew um, Genesis Mm -hmm. Ale for Hanukkah of 1996. Wow. And I drove it around um, delivering to a handful of Whole Foods and store, independent stores in Northern California. I drove it around in my grandmother's Volvo, mm-hmm. a story that I have told many times. And there's pictures of the Volvo in the car mm-hmm. and the book. Um, and uh, uh, from 96, it was just uh, a, a total experiment. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't a brewer. I wasn't a business person. I'd never taken a business class. I'd never taken a brewing class. Um, I'd taken more classes about the sacred species than I had about anything to do with the actual business. I didn't know uh, what an invoice was. I didn't Mm -hmm. know what margins were, Um, but I thought it would be fun and interesting and meaningful. And so I did a bunch of friends who helped out and Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of got it off the ground. And then I did that for many, many years until 2003, at -hmm. which point I switched the production from Northern California to a brewery in upstate New York that was mm-hmm. owned by a brewery from California. Oh, and I wow. moved on to my friend's couch in uh, Park Slope in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, and I lived on his couch for a little while before getting my own little sublet in Williamsburg. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, uh, beer, I drove around the East Coast and I went door to door asking wholesalers if we could get beer. Mm-hmm. And I ended up with 18 wholesalers, coincidentally. And that fall from Russia to Thanksgiving, I did a cross country trip called 40 Days and 40 Nights, the <laughs> Wandering Hebrew Beer Tour of America. Oh, nice. And uh, it, it went from San Francisco to New York and went to mm-hmm. every one of my wholesalers and did events and met with Jewish community groups and the media, but also did homebrewer events and went to beer festivals and beer bars. And um, 
that kicked off an era that really was um, very, very important and enormous amount of work and a lot of miles on the car for the next five years. Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned not having had brewing experience, not even home brewing. And then you just no, started. Nope. Nothing, and then, so I imagine nope. in those, those California years of, of the operation, you learned a lot, right? I learned a lot about everything. I mean, I <laughs> obviously the business head. side, definitely. I, I get yeah. that. But even my approach is to, um, yeah, my approach is to ask everybody that I could get my hands on how to do anything. Cause you know, I really want mm-hmm. not trained at any of this. So, mm-hmm. um, I would ask, um, friends who were brewers. I mean, Northern California was incredibly rich with, uh, beautiful flavors and complex processes and experiments. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was, I was able to have access to people who became like heroes of the entire brewing world um, yeah. when they were kind of just getting into their, the prime of their earlier years. Mm-hmm. And I got some really incredible advice along the way from some people who'd been in the industry for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Pete from Pete's Wicked Ale, Pete Slossberg was mm-hmm. surprisingly, I didn't even know it was a member of my synagogue in Los Altos, California. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow, and yeah, and then became my neighbor in the Mission District. We lived near each other um, many wow. years later. It's been incredibly supportive. But so wow. were uh, so many brewers. I mean, that well, 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 Anchor Steam is there, of, right? Anchor Steam is there. And yeah, they, Anchor, they're the founders of the craft beer movement. So Anchor right. was kind of considered the first. Um, Sierra also uh, yeah. up there. Um, there was a brewery called New Albion that everybody knows, but um, that didn't quite make it. But mm-hmm. um, Anchor was in my neighborhood. So I was in the mission on the corner of uh, Cesar Chavez and Valencia when I started. And my first beer class was with um, a one million year old Jewish man named Dr. Joe O'Eighties uh-huh. that every single person in beer knew. He was um, uh, an incredible resource. He He helped Jim Cook work on the first recipes for Sam Adams. And, um, so he gave a class at anchor. Hmm. He had been Fritz Maytag's kind of, uh, beer consigliere basically. Wow. And uh, (laughs) so I got a chance to go take a beer, a beer tasting class with Dr. Joe O'Eighties, which was really cool. And his son ended up being the kosher buyer at fairway in New York. When I later would go sell beer to the fairway, uh, beer, um, beer buyers, I would go over and say hi to his kid. So, uh, it was my age, of course, <laughs> right. because I know Fritz Maytag the fourth was he, he, mm-hmm. he wasn't about to hold on to things, he definitely shared and helped cultivate a culture of, of sharing, whether it was yeast or other things in the Bay Area to help in knowledge the, starting yeah. in the 60s so and going on. One of the most amazing things about our industry, and it still exists, um, maybe a little bit less than it had, but. The feeling that we were all in it together and those mm-hmm. early pioneers who, unlike so many other industries, um, would kind of hide their secrets and mm-hmm. hold on so tightly. These yeah. guys just gave it to everybody. They they shared all their knowledge. They would write articles. They'd give presentations, not about how great they were and how smart and how well-funded they were, but how in, how creative and, and how experimental and how passionate and um, that set the tone for generational um, sharing of knowledge, mm-hmm. and it was I was directly um, the I was the direct recipient of that mm-hmm. generosity, and that made a huge difference while I was trying to grow my business. That I could call friends from anywhere in the country, whether it was um, you know friends from every region or every type of brewery, and say, "How do I do it? How do I manage wholesalers? How do I?" manage teams? How do we produce this kind of beer? How do we get this kind of ingredients? What do we do about these financial questions and incredible support from every every part of the industry, which is mm-hmm. completely unheard of in other, in other types of businesses. Um, yeah. It's a really special part of craft beer. That's really neat. So in those California years, those first seven years, what was, can you give us a general sense of the volume of the production output you were making? And then tiny, what was that tiny, like tiny. to once you hit <laughs> New York 2003 and what I imagine it wasn't static, right? Whatever you were brewing in 2003 for the, the total barrel output was not the same as in 2013, which is probably not going to be the same going forward. No. And, and so, part um, of the, part of the question I want to also throw piggyback to that, which is, Sure. What have the changes been in the growth of the craft beer scene? And how much has that yeah. have you experienced in, in the Hebrew story? 
Sure. Well, craft beer over those years went from 2% to about 20%, give or take. It's about to, it's, it, the numbers are a little tricky because a lot of companies have been bought and uh, the names, you know, the definitions change. But as we all know, craft beer now is here to stay. It's an important mm-hmm. part of the economy. It's an enormous um, driver of jobs. And uh, um, uh, it's been a really, it's a, it's a truly profound American success story that mm-hmm. we're really proud of. And this group became inspiration for brewers all over the world who looked to the United States brewers mm-hmm. um, after the U S brewers had looked to certain European brewers and traditional mm-hmm. brewers in a way, because remember we were 2% of a market that was 98% light lagers and mainstream kind of industrial beer. And now that is just not simply the definition of beer. I mean, IPAs are just mm-hmm. as well known. Mm-hmm. If somebody said, um, you know, light lager is the definition of beer, the next person sitting at a restaurant <laughs> or a bar would say, well, actually, you know, IPAs. Um, so that's that's an incredible accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um, Schmaltz Brewing during that time in Hebrew beer, we did 100 cases for Hanukkah of 96. Mm-hmm. Um, by 2003, um, we had to brew, I moved to the new facility, we had to brew um, 1,300 cases at a time, hmm. and we did two different beer styles, so that was terrifying. Um, <laughs> I did that, was able to sell those and keep growing, and mm-hmm. from there, grew the company to about 100, a yeah, lot of 100,000 or 120,000 cases a year, mm-hmm. um, when I had a team uh, of sales reps and marketing people that were around the country. Um, you mentioned we had a brand called Coney Island Craft Loggers that I started in Brooklyn as well in 2007 and 2008. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really a magical time and I was very grateful for my own experiences. But I also think this is uh, the absolute best time to be a craft beer consumer is right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. You have unlimited choice and um, every single neighborhood in the country has a fantastic brewer who's doing great mm-hmm. stuff. So it's, I, I love um, kind of taking my role to be a little bit more on the consulting side and a little bit more on the consumer side, mm-hmm. but I'm also going to be really excited because um, you're going to meet Jesse, um, my new partner in, uh, in Schmaltz here and my um, next generation of uh, Hebrew beer and, uh, taking the baton and running with it in a way that I think will be uh, really opportunistic and um, fitting into the values that I started the company with um, while expanding kind of the scope of even things that I was conscious of at the time and that he's really dialed into and and very passionate about. So I couldn't be happier to, to find somebody like Jesse to to have take over the reins of this incredible experiment still ongoing. That's a great tease. And we'll get there. We'll get there. (laughs) I hope you're enjoying this episode so far about Schmaltz Brewing. I wanted to break in and give you a sneak peek into the next episode about another created, Jewishly created company, alcohol company here in America. Here we go. We are not putting anything into a barrel that really requires any filtering at all because there Mm. are no tails. It tastes beautiful as a white spirit, a white whiskey or a brandy. Just for clarification, it's not, you're not saying that there are no tails that in your production, you just don't include any tails. We don't include any tails. Uh, Heads and tails still happen. You just, you're only including. We're not, we're not a scientific anomaly. I hope you enjoy that sneak peek featuring Dr. Hart, it's not coming out next week. It'll be coming out the final Tuesday of November. We're going to take a couple week break for Thanksgiving, and I hope you come back for that. All right, now back into this episode. I want to talk about Kashru, but I also want to talk about the any adverse uh, reactions to the overtly Jewish. Look, we are, I would say, anti-Semitism is the oldest hate. And, right. Well, so, I, and, and I we have been you. only more aware of that in the last recent years. So, yeah, uh, for something is so visibly uh, maybe a lightning rod uh, about Jewish stuff. I mean, wh- what stuff? Have yeah. Been so throughout that, the quarter century. Interestingly. Yeah. So interestingly, every article that an interview I did for the first five or six years, mm-hmm. um, somebody asked if if I got a lot of, um, you know, weird comments or yeah. pushback or it was considered offensive. And I, I said, well, if you, have you read the label? Have you read the press release? And remember, that's when I had in the in the first few years, I had this my my uh, girlfriend at the time, time 
did was an artist and, and really talented artist and she did this incredible painting of the rabbi dancing above the stones of Jerusalem and the Golden Gate Bridge um, and it looked like this in kind of incredible ode to Chagall and mm. Ruth kind of with a modern twist yeah. but it was this huge green rabbi that should have been on like a playbill it would have been mm. no big deal. Everybody would, oh my God, it's gorgeous. But on mm. a beer label, oh wow, well now what's going on? And so <laughs> honestly, I got more, I got more weird comments from Jews than I did from non-Jews. <laughs> so um non-Jews were just like, whoa, um, is that a problem? And I'm like, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Right. And, uh, and they said, OK, well, if it's not, I said, you know, I've done fundraising. I poured beer for every Hillel and every federation and every young adults division and every synagogue in Northern California at that time. And then around the country for years and years and years. I mean, when I said it was an inside joke, I, I don't mean that it wasn't serious. It was just a very uh, uh, serious attempt at being funny. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think there's a certain nature about beer and people who drink beer that there's a certain amount of levity, not totally 100% taking oneself seriously. And I think you definitely took that and married that to the Jewish piece. And I think Jews also have a sense of humor, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, so, and I Mel think it Brooks, just marries those two together. Yeah. So the word schmaltz, we, we didn't talk about it, but yeah. um, so schmaltz, uh, obviously we know means chicken fat, Yiddish. Yeah. So it was an attempt to kind of recreate like a comfort food from a mm. sentimental era, but with a common uh, kind of a new generational twist to it through craft beer. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, the word um, schmaltz has the word malt in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. So Anchor and Sierra were using all malt. It was very different from the corn and the rice spears that were being made at the big industrial breweries. Mm -hmm. But obviously the last thing is schmaltz means like an over-the-top sense of humor. Uh, I mean, I look to Henny Youngman and Sid Caesar and Mel Brooks and mm -hmm. Ronnie Dangerfield and Sarah Silverman and, you know, the kind of uh, seinfeld -y endless jokes that we can have. <laughs> That's my inspiration for my personal pop cultural connection. And I think that that came through. It took a little while, but by the time we were, you know, distributed in, in enough places and had had. I mean, we won it. We really um, have had an incredible run. We've won every award beer, beer award there is to win mm -hmm. um, at a really talented team. And um, we've got an incredible history and a great foundation. So I, I love that at that time, that was what I wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thrilled that Jesse has a vision for where he's going to go with this um, moving forward. So it's, it's very exciting. I'm going to double click into the malt piece. So I, I noticed that, how would you describe the beers in the whole? I mean, obviously we we're talking about the anniversary of the Jubilee beers, yeah, high gravity, high ABV barley wines, which are amazing. And one of my favorite styles, but I also noticed even like the hop mana, it's a yeah. lovely, the, the, the hops, uh, give That's like rich. they pop, but at the same yeah. time it has a nice multi backbone. So would you describe them as tend tending? I haven't definitely have not had the entire library of your beers, but are they tend to okay. be more malty, especially yeah. coming from well, California where the West coast, they definitely with their IPAs, they go very hot forward and less on the malt. Right. So Yeah. Well, so we, we got get the best of both worlds. My West mm -hmm. coast roots were beers like um, barley wines from anchor and Sierra mm -hmm. um, extreme beers early on from Anderson Valley and North coast. Mm -hmm. um, so I would describe my flavor forward but also um, not to style. So oh, really? <laughs> originally the beers were intended to go with the shtick and then uh, we make a complex beer to match. Why are we making a beer called Rejuvenator? It's a blend of yeasts from all over the world that no, literally no other brewer ever did it. It was a one of a kind beer at the time. Oh, wow. Um, beer like Jubilation, which was not a porter. It was not a stout. It was a one of a kind. It was a triple brown ale, essentially, <laughs> with 14 malts and 14 hops and 14% alcohol. Um, so I loved the fact that. I was going to say, you didn't, yeah. you didn't try to color in the lines for the BJCP guidelines, right? <laughs> no. So, and people would say that all the time. And yeah. luckily, listen, we were in an era where experimentation was rewarded um, mm. through the market. People, that's what people wanted. They wanted crazy beers. We called them at the time, extreme beers. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there were beer festivals um, all over the country. And we participated in all of them. I went, mm -hmm. I, we traveled either I did or my team did 
And we would make these big bombastic beers that had enormous amounts of flavors and we were rewarded. We were named one of the top 50 and then one of the top hundred breweries in the world, multiple mm. years. Um, wow. We won and, uh, with one of our craziest beers ever, which was a barrel aged blend of eight different sour beers. It was um, Rodenbach <laughs> won the gold, the 300 year old sour brewery that yeah. kind of defines reality. Europe and then Schmaltz Brewing Funky Jubilation. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so that was really cool. And, and um, I think that always helped that I could be different without having to be. I was a contract brewer. Um, it was a crazy Jewish brand with a dancing rabbi and a bunch mm -hmm. of puns on it. Um, yeah. And so that gave me a kind of freedom to experiment and create in a way that other people didn't necessarily have as uh, access to. And it was a lot of fun and incredibly delicious. And uh, so like even just our last beer is called Exodus 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or, sorry, yeah, to Exodus 2021, which was our 25th anniversary beer. Um, pomegranates, dates, figs, grapes, all in an 8.8% .8 barley wine. Mm -hmm. um, it's absolutely it luscious and lovely. And it won mm -hmm. a silver medal for our silver anniversary. It happened to win a silver medal uh, in the largest um, blind taste professional taste uh, te um, competition in New York through the New York State Brewers Association. Oh, that's amazing. So it's a really special year. All right. So speaking of New York State, so I, I get to talk about the the kosher stuff. So I remember visiting my father in law in Rochester, New York, probably 2014, 2015, and going to the Flower City uh, Brew Fest and yeah. you know perusing the different breweries. Obviously, I, I chance upon Hebrew Schmaltz and. I asked the the lovely sales reps who are absolutely not Jewish, and I said something about the kosher piece, and I I was just like appreciative that there was kosher certification on the beer, which is not that frequently common. True. And so they said something that I never heard before, and it totally changed my approach to to kosher certification, which is <laughs> they said this is a great marketing piece, and I never ever 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 thought of kosher certification as being a marketing or, or branding opportunity so yeah we so i've been hanging out with the kosher rabbis lately i uh, need to do more of that so um my question to you is so going back how did you decide was it from the start when did you get kosher certification how has that over the the quarter century been how's that process been yes I first started in san francisco you know, regular beer made at a regular brewery in a regular way with regular ingredients doesn't mm -hmm. really need to be kosher certified. It's uh, right. there were some there were some clarifiers and some fining agents that were made from fish guts long ago. Isinglass, yeah, they're not Eisenglass. they're not used anymore. Mm -hmm. Isinglass not used anymore mm -hmm. at homebrew shops sometimes. But mm -hmm. um, so in San Francisco, look, there's not a big Orthodox community. I was friendly mm -hmm. with um, Rabbi Langer at the Chabad House there, who was an incredibly supportive. Helper, we did Purim parties with Modest Yahoo, and he did mm. a commercial for me. And the beer wasn't kosher; it was kosher. It was kosher, it wasn't kosher certified. Mm. Um, so once I got into LA and Chicago and New York, though, obviously there were more questions. So I started working mm. with Kosher Supervision of America, mm. and um, Rabbi Lisbon and his crew did an unbelievable job of helping me for many, many years. Mm. And they were just starting out. I didn't realize uh, I was looking back couple of years ago, they just started when I had started. So oh, wow. they didn't have, you know, now they're on, you know, Martinelli's apple juice and, mm -hmm. and tortillas, the uh, biggest supermarkets in the country, mm -hmm. but um, they were a small company then too. And he's mm -hmm. grown his own uh, operation. So they worked really well with me. Um, and I had the beer kosher certified for many years. I mean, we, you know, we on occasion got into it because uh, for instance, <laughs> you know, who, who owned the barrels during last Passover mm. that your beer is aging in this Passover. Mm. And I said, this is what we're worried about. And he mm. said, we're just asking. And I said, they're from Sazerac at Buffalo trace. And he said, Ooh. okay, well, um, <laughs> but you own them this Passover, right? Because you know, there's Jewish people in the liquor industry that own certain uh, brands. Yeah, and Sazerac. sometimes they want to, um, sell their um, their comments mm -hmm. during the, and sometimes the fax doesn't go through. So um, 
Yeah, you Sazerac know, it, hasn't. I mean, Heaven Hill, they sell their chametz, but yeah. Yeah, it's so, uh, it's so it's an interesting dynamic yeah. for the most part. You know, it would come up <laughs> once in a while. Okay. We were very careful. I mean, even okay. when I was getting the pomegranate puree, we had a beer for many years. I bought pomegranate puree. Sometimes it was from Turkey. Sometimes it was from Iran. It was mm-hmm. always kosher certified before it got here. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really, Bourbon casks that maybe have been used for sherry, that can be a problem. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Otherwise, if it's just straight bourbon, it's usually not that big of a deal. Right. And uh, fruits. Um, and then over the last few years, it's actually become less in fashion. That for a little while, uh, milkshake IPAs were made with lactose. Mm-hmm. And so depending on the percentage of the drop that ends up in your <laughs> soup, uh, you know, mm-hmm. cauldron, as you yep. too well know, um, mm-hmm. Depending on how big the drop is, the 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 um, lactose IPA might need a little extra level of some some before it goes. Although in. a lot of a lot of breweries use kosher certified lactose, which is good. That true. That true. Not but always, I, but a yeah, lot of times. I think it's also the process. So oh, okay, um, making sure that the vessels um, uh, are koshered before that version mm. of it goes in because it wasn't so much that it won't be kosher. It just has to be um, milk. You know, it can't mm. just be parve. And most of the time you just want beer that's parve because mm. you really want to drink beer with some big, you know, pastrami sandwiches. And it happens. Definitely bacon. happens. So it happens. <laughs> but uh, so it would say, listen, it's an adventure. I think uh, the kosher certification part is a, is a lovely conversation to be had. Mm-hmm. Um, it's such a small part of the market that mm. what really ends up happening is it's more for non-Jewish buyers at a grocery store. who just don't care one way or the other. They just want to know. They want the kosher Passover Coke. Or huh. they don't want it anywhere near it. They don't want to get in trouble. Just trying to be nice and sensitive, and they're looking out for their customers. Hmm. Um, and they also don't want mean emails after the holiday. <laughs> <clears throat> Makes their job easier. Hello, I hope you're enjoying the show. I wanted to break in again and see if you. Well, hopefully you're enjoying it. And I, in the past, I've asked if anybody has any ideas of what Jewish drinking can do beyond the show, beyond different things we can do. But we have the added benefit, the added bonus that Jewish Drinking is now an officially recognized 501c3 organization by the IRS. So that means you it is now tax deductible if you want to make donations and we can see what we can do, what new things we can do. So I'm always open and you are welcome to email me, to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Hopefully you reach out to me and I'm always open to questions, ideas, suggestions, anything you might have. So please feel free. Re- Feel free to reach out to me and thank you. And now back into the show. So we're going to bring on Jesse. So <laughs> let me introduce this by when I, when I reached out to you, Jeremy, originally I caught this last fall, fall 2021 press release that said, we're shutting down Schmaltz is ending, especially you mentioned the 25th anniversary barley wine you were releasing. That would be it. No more Schmaltz finito closing the doors, locking it up. And then surprise you're selling it to Jesse here. So What has that process been like? How did you, instead of locking the doors and walking away, how did you decide to sell it? Yeah. Well, this is is actually an amazing way to say it for the very first time publicly that Jesse and I are are doing right now, because it was basically, it was about 10 months ago on a a Zoom, much like Mm this, Mm -hmm. um, with the absolutely wonderful Rob Eshman, the um, executive Mm -hmm. editor of The Forward, previously Mm -hmm. at the Jewish Journal, was an incredible guy. Um, And he went out of his way. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For my my 25th anniversary, um, he had me on for an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I don't know if it was in the middle or afterwards, but he said, hey, there's this guy... I, I think he's a rabbi or, or I'm not sure, but he wants to know what you're doing with Hebrew and schmaltz. Hmm. Um, should I tell him or should you tell him or what's going to happen? And so it turned out that um, Jesse had emailed me and hmm. it was a little bit of a crazy time. I was doing the tour and kind of wrapping things up and I'm notoriously poor on email sometimes. <laughs> um, but with Rob Ashman's, um, uh yenta Urging? abilities yeah um he made the match and next thing i know jesse and i are meeting at a 
uh, um, bar and grill. And I think I want to say New Jersey a warehouse, a storage warehouse. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I just absolutely adore his vision for how he wants to be in the world. And, hmm. uh, uh I'm really proud of him for the things that he's accomplished so far. And I'm really looking for things that are yet before him. And so hmm. when I, I used to joke, when I started um, Schmaltz in Hebrew, I was just basically starting a Jewish nonprofit hmm. and I wanted to be an arts organization and a cultural organization. And then I wasn't profitable for too long and realized I needed to start a brewery. So I did that. <laughs> and yeah. um, in doing so, I think I built a foundation that now, um, I'm really excited for Jesse to be able to uh, build upon, and um, he's got some incredible ideas and wonderful connections. And weirdly, he's 26. Are you still 26? He's still 26. Uh, 20, 26 as of yesterday. 26. Nice. Oh, so now he's officially happy old enough to I take over. Your that's double amazing. bar mitzvah. <laughs> Whoa, that's awesome. So uh, I'll let him tell you his own story, but I'm I'm really thrilled and. Uh, I was ready to exit this 2021 last year, and this is even better is uh, re regenesis 2022 and to mm. wherever we're heading together into the future. So, um, mm. yeah, we'll let you take it away. And Rabbi Drew, here's uh, Rabbi Jesse. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I, I saw Schmaltz and I figured all you needed was the actual real life dancing rabbi. <laughs> to, to come in and and so and I and I love dance, but I'm not quite a rabbi yet. I am a third year rabbinical student at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. Uh, where it, I just it, started my third. Yeah, I should say on the New York campus as opposed to in my town in Cincinnati. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have three campuses in the U.S. Yes. Los Angeles, Cincinnati, and New York, as well mm -hmm. as our campus in Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. I just started my third year on the New York campus out of five years total. So I still have a way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this for me is a, a real Lador Vador moment from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. I was born the same year as Schmaltz in 1996. Yep. Schmaltz and I were born together. And, uh, you know, Jeremy, uh, you were talking about how you got this started uh, about 10 years after high school. And I'm, I'm approaching that point too, um, mm -hmm. and taking the reins and, and, you know, we're really moving forward with the, with the next phase of this Jeremy is going to remain involved in a whole bunch of different capacities. Yeah, and I'm really excited to learn from him. He's going to be my, my business and beer rabbi in, in a big way. Mm, uh, that's amazing. You know, and we're, we're really going to learn from each other, which is, which is really nice. You know, I, uh, I, when I was in undergrad, I went to Skidmore college up in Saratoga Springs, New York, not mm. too far from where Jeremy had a lot of the Schmaltz operations base with the, mm. with the Clifton Park operation and the, you know, his tasting room up in Troy. And so I, when I was mm. a college student, just getting interested in craft beer for the first time, I knew a little bit of Schmaltz. You know, I, I was president of Hillel at my college and, mm. um, you know, people knew I liked beer and they're like, oh, you got to check this thing out. You know, it's, <laughs> it's great. There's, there's a rabbi on it and, you know, it's, mm. there's a, there's a Messiah beer, you know, it's, it's great. So I, I had a few of them. I loved it, but, and, and Schmaltz, uh, you know, the, the company stayed in the back of my head for a few years and mm. yeah, because of my interest in Judaism and beer, I would check in every, every few months, uh, every few years on how Schmaltz was doing anything new, what's come out, <laughs> um, you know, until, uh, until my second year of rabbinical school last November, almost exactly a year ago, I saw the press release. Schmaltz was closing. Schmaltz was, uh, was doing the big exodus. Um, mm. And this was after two years of pandemic, during which time right. I started home brewing. I, I, actually, ah. I, I left my apartment in Manhattan. I moved back in with my mom for a few months. Much to her dismay, I made the house smell like yeast, brewing some beer in mm -hmm. the basement. I made an amber ale. I made an IPA. It was actually, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I got, I got even more interested in craft beer. So when uh, when I saw the press release that Schmaltz was closing, I, I saw a whole bunch of the events that were announced, the the um, webinar with the forward, and you know I did join <laughs> that, and I submitted a whole bunch of questions on Zoom. What are you going to do next? Are you looking to sell? I read an interview with Jeremy. Um, you know the interviewer said, "Are you going to sell it?" And Jeremy, I think you said, "No, I'll probably hold on to it unless." the right young couple steps off of a birthright trip or you know, the, the right <laughs> Jewish deli has, has the passion. And I was like, that's me. I'm, I'm not, wow. I'm not yeah. guy. so, um, you know, <laughs> I, I started sending in my questions. I, I hmm. sent you an email and almost right away, despite uh, your supposed 
bad track record with emails. You got back to me saying, yeah, let's get on the phone. Here's my number. And we wow. started talking. Um, you know, we had a we had a lot to work with, 25 years of, of history of this company. Um, but nine and a half months later, um, we we started this transition. And you know, it's gonna mm. take a while. We're gonna relaunch. And um, you know, we have we have a ton of ideas for how to how to honor the history of the, the 25 years of Schmaltz, mm -hmm. as well as the 3,000 years of Jewish brewing history. And, you know, by the way, if not more, if not more, yes, if not more, really excited. Jesse, uh, I'll tee it up for him. But, you know, his idea was originally to create kind of a space. Mm -hmm. um, and we may see where it all goes, but that space could be a Jewish deli brew pub, or it could be a place where um, Jewish organizations get together. Um, and we have friends who've been working on projects like these in Philly and Miami and LA and San Francisco and New York for many years. And we've got an incredible group of supporters who want to see have, uh, these ideas evolve that I'm really excited about. But um, what I really am most I'm like kind of profoundly proud of for Jesse is his connection to um, the spirit of the age with young people doing the kind of repair of the world that we talked about so much in the 90s into the 2000s and now is a is a truly egalitarian effort to reach um people in all different kinds of life through a jewish lens and with a sense of jewish leadership and so that i'm really proud of Ju jesse's ideas to go this direction with the beers so speaking of that and Jesse's ideas and direction, so when officially did the sale close and what sort of the, I guess, Jeremy, Jeremy, how much did Jesse keep you on as a mentor slash advisor? Yeah, it was just such a so, sweetheart deal for Jesse yeah, that he gets to we, have you there. Well, we loved it. it. We, we were able to um, navigate to be able to close the deal after Jesse had a wonderful four, uh, series of months in Israel mm -hmm. and came back just in time for me to have a few glorious weeks in Europe. And um, so we were able to close this kind of the end of the summer. And so I'm staying on. I mean, Schmaltz uh, is going to be Jesse's baby. Um, but Jeremy, uh, first 25 years uh, and old Schmaltz, uh, original OG Schmaltz still has 10% of the project. Oh, nice. And, um, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be involved. And uh, this is going to be Jesse's um kind of a multi-year experiment and new direction. But, hmm. you know, I love, I, I'm already doing consulting uh, for the rest of my professional life. And this is like <laughs> a heartfelt project that I can be um, whatever service I can. So Jesse will call me whenever and how much, or he'll, he'll find uh, a whole slew. I really, I love that he's already been finding a whole network of advisors and supporters who want to see him um, succeed and want this project to go to to where it will and where it'll grow to. And Jer so, Jeremy, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. This has been fantastic. Thank you guys. One last thing, Thanks which is, yeah, which is, it. if you're going to come on a podcast, it's a great opportunity to pitch something. So, do you, Jeremy and or Jesse, have anything that you would like to pitch to the audience? Yeah, of course. So to promote, um, pitch, promote. Yeah. Yeah. So well, the, the best thing is that you guys are getting the preview of what we'll be able to share with everybody over the coming months. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse and I will be working on a more formal announcement that will be coming out. And so please go to schmaltzbrewing.com as well as um, schmaltzbrewing on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we want to have people keep in touch because this will be a very collaborative next stage. Um, we're going to be having events possibly other products as well, ways for people to engage with what we've accomplished so far and what we're going to be working on in the future. And so our big, big pitch to you right now is join the, if you go on the website, hit, join the email list, um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, um, and Twitter. And then Jesse will be taking over social media here shortly. We'll have emails going out to our newsle newsletter list. And we'll start re-engaging with this community that was, I mean, talk about a profoundly supportive community that is in a way um, by choice. I mean, I I wasn't I wasn't a rabbi, I wasn't a brewer, I wasn't a, a, a businessman. I drove around the country for many many years and lived in neighborhoods across the country and sold beer and created these 
products that uh, I was very proud to share with people. And this incredible group of humans came together in a mm. project called Schmaltz Brewing. And whether that wow. was consumers, um, salespeople, buyers, and all of the support um, that went into making the successful foundation. Uh, I'm really, really grateful and super proud of what we accomplished and looking forward to absolutely crazy, fun, delicious adventure <laughs> that is ahead of us. That is my pitch for the moment. Keep, keep in touch and we will do the same. Jeremy, Amazing. you said it all. I completely agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I'm just so, so excited. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. This has been fantastic guys. Jesse me and Jeremy, Jesse and Jeremy. And uh, thank you so much. And Lachaim. Lachaim.